I think it's crazy that 60% is going to the Pentagon. Our future challenges and the threats to our national security are going to come from a lot of places that have nothing to do uh, with weapons and guns. That's the voice of Leilani Munter, biology graduate turned race car driver and environmental activist. She's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. But first, here are your co-hosts, Joe Cirincioni and Michelle Dover. Welcome back to Press the Button. This is our 57th episode and our ninth week of quarantine. Uh, I'm recording this in my basement in Tacoma Park, Maryland. And I am recording this from a closet in New Haven, Connecticut. On early warning today, we ask what comes next now that we know Kim Jong-un is alive. And we mark the two-year anniversary since the U.S. withdrew from the Iran anti-nuclear deal. We are really excited to have Harry Kazianis from the Center for the National Interest join us as a guest. You might have noticed we are now publishing a weekly article on the national interest, so it was really a pleasure to have Harry join us. You also may have noticed that Zach Brown, one of the producers on this show, and I have a weekly column now that runs on the National Interest website. We get to take the uh, interviews from our weekly guests and turn them into an analysis, uh, the core of what they're saying, adding our own take on it as well. I hope you'll go to the National Interest and take a look at these articles every week and all the other great content there. And I'm really excited to write up this interview. We have something special for you today. We have... Leilani Munter, a NASCAR driver, an environmentalist, a vegan, an advocate for zero population growth. And you may ask yourself, like the talking heads, you may ask yourself, is this my nuclear podcast? (laughs) What is a NASCAR driver doing on my nuclear podcast? Well, it's because what we're focusing on for the next few weeks and what you've been listening for the last few weeks is how we have to fundamentally rethink national security. We have to close this 19-year chapter that began with the 9-11 attacks, where we have militarized our national security policy, militarized our foreign policy, and have been looking for military solutions to the threats we face. But as the pandemic shows, the very real threats we face do not have military solutions. We have to reorient. We have to change our budgets. We have to change our priorities. And a big part of that, of course, is nuclear weapons. But in order to get to the nuclear weapons part, you have to understand the whole problem. That's what Leilani does on our interview today. And man, is she good. It was a real pleasure to talk to her about the intersection of national security and the development of a sustainable world. As always, if you like the show, Please give us ratings wherever you listen to your podcast, whether it is Apple or Spotify. Um, It is your feedback that makes this show better. If this is your first time listening to the show, please subscribe, rate, and share. We'd love to get your feedback and ratings. Thanks for taking the time to listen today. We have a great episode for you, and the clock is ticking. And now... Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thanks, Dal. Joining me today is Harry Kazianis, Senior Director of Korean Studies at the Center for the National Interest. Harry, it has been such a pleasure working with you in your capacity as executive editor at the National Interest, and I am so excited that you could be with us today. Oh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it jumping on the podcast. Also joining us is Mary Kaczynski, Deputy Director of Policy here at Plowshares Fund. Thanks, Michelle. So you two know how this goes. We have seven minutes to cover the world's nuclear news, and our time starts now. Harry, last week, Fox News published a piece that you wrote in response to the news that Kim Jong-un is, in fact, alive in which you laid out a roadmap that President Trump should take to re-engage North Korea diplomatically. What steps should he be taking first? 
Well, I, I think the first thing is, is the Trump administration needs to have a recognition that this is not going to be an easy road, which I think they figured out from the last two summits and some of the different things that they proposed to the Kim regime. But if the, if the Trump administration does feel like there is a path forward, you know, if they do have some space in between a presidential election, a pandemic, then I, I think there is some practical things they could offer the North Koreans to sort of pull them out of diplomatically engaging. I, I think the first thing that they need to do is if you're trying to convince a state that might have anywhere from 25 to as many as 60 nuclear weapons to start the process of denuclearization, you have to say to them that we're not in a state of war anymore. And I think a lot of people forget this. Even some of the most advanced scholars on Korean studies today forget this. We are still in a state of war with North Korea. Uh, the, the, the Korean War never ended. All we have is an armistice. So I think if Donald Trump said to, to Moon Jae-in and to Kim Jong-un and said, look, the, the, the foundation of, of denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula should be a state of peace between all parties involved. I, I think that would be something that, that Kim Jong-un would strongly consider. I mean, he would be the first North Korean leader to be able to go back home to Pyongyang and to say, I did something that my grandfather never done. I did something that my father never done. I have, I, we are now in a state of peace with the Americans. And I think that would give him the political leverage that he needs to make bigger concessions. The other thing I would offer to you is this. We are making a fundamental mistake when it comes to Korea policy, because it seems like the thing that we were always so obsessed with is this first step of the North Koreans somehow giving us all of their nuclear weapons. I think John Bolton had this famous quote a few years ago that we could take C-130s and just go pick them all up on the tarmac. That's outrageous. I, I don't care where you are on the political spectrum. So I think the first thing that we have to do before really anything is, is to have a process where denuclearization comes at the very end of a very long process of normalization, like a peace treaty or peace declaration ending the Korean War, liaison offices between both sides or even embassies if we, we would recognize North Korea. But I think you have to do those things first. We're trying to do the hardest thing first when it comes to North Korea, and that's to give up their ace card. Nobody's going to do that if you don't have a relationship. You already mentioned, you know, there's a pandemic, there's a U.S. election. What do you think about the administration's abilities to move forward with these really practical steps? You know, it's a great question. And really, for the last few weeks, I did not think that that would be possible in terms of engaging with the North Koreans. But we have to remember, President Trump is going to need some things to go to the American people with, with a, with a, with a history to say, these are my accomplishments. Before the pandemic, the one thing that he could argue is that the economy was relatively good. Now, President Trump liked to say it was the best economy ever. We know that's not true. I don't care where you sit on <laughs> wherever your politics are. But hey, that's look, that's him, whatever. But he, he could make that argument. The unemployment rate was low. You know, he, he had an economic record to run on. He doesn't have that now. So this president is going to be looking for other historical markers to go to the American people and said, I did this, I did this, I did that. And if he's able to, to make forward progress on North Korea, even if it's a political declaration that you know, in all, all fairness, really isn't a treaty or isn't binding. But if he can set a marker with North Korea to say, hey, we are making progress with the Kim regime, we're, we're, we're making practical steps, you know, we're, we're working towards ending what is essentially still the Cold War on the Korean Peninsula. I, I don't think that's going to win the election for him, but that is something that, you know, if you're in conservative circles, you know that's going to get pumped through Fox News and, and all the different conservative aggregators and, and, and get the base a little bit more excited. So for him, if he is looking for these milestones, for these pages of history, if you will, that's one that could be out there for him. Thanks, Harry. Turning our eyes towards Iran, Mary, last week marked the two-year anniversary since the Trump administration withdrew from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which limited Iran's nuclear program. And since then, U.S. sanctions have crippled Iran's economy while Iran has slowly begun resuming activities that were limited under the agreement. Two years out, what does, the, what does Iran's nuclear program look like and what comes next? Thanks, Michelle. So in the two years since the U.S. withdrew from the agreement, Iran has gradually begun reducing its compliance with the JCPOA. So they've started taking steps to violate the deal. And 
altogether, those steps have begun to chip away at Iran's breakout time, so the amount of time it could take Iran to produce enough fissile material for a nuclear weapon. Experts say that time, which was about a year and a half when Iran was complying with the JCPOA, that time has now been reduced by about half, so to about about 10 months, say. So that's definitely concerning, you know, and Iran would not have taken these steps very likely if the U.S. had remained in compliance. So it's been a direct result of the actions by the Trump administration. It's really important to keep in mind, though, that the steps Iran has taken so far are all relatively minor and all reversible. And Iran has made it very clear that if the U.S. comes back into compliance, Iran would be willing to do the same. So that's a reason to to be optimistic, I think, that if the U.S. administration were willing to come back into compliance and Iran does the same, they could potentially use that as a starting point for new negotiations. Well, it's something we'll definitely have to keep an eye on as uh, the pandemic continues and given the questions about what will happen in the U.N. Security Council. Definitely. That's the U.N. Security Council is something to keep an eye on. The U.S. has uh, raised concerns about the arms embargo on Iran that expires this fall. The U.S. is potentially going to introduce a resolution to extend that arms embargo, which would likely fail. But it's an issue that the U.S. is continuously raising the, the conventional arms embargo and kind of tying that to the fate of the nuclear deal. Well, with that, our seven minutes are up. Harry, Mary, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me. I'm Joe Serencioni, and I'm here virtually with Leilani Munter. Sports Illustrated named her one of the top 10 female race car drivers in the world. Glamour Magazine called her an eco-hero. If you go to her website, lilani.green or lilanimunter.com, you see that she, uh, the banner is a great picture of, of you, Leilani, in uniform. Never underestimate a vegan hippie chick with a race car. Thank you so much for coming on and, and spending a little time talking to me about how you went from a biology graduate to a race car driver, to an environmental activist. <laughs> I know it's a, it's a funny combination. And um, I, you know, I really, I was an environmental activist before I was a race car driver. I earned a degree from the University of California in San Diego. Um, my degree was in biology, specializing in ecology, behavior, and evolution. And I've always been really worried about what humans were doing to the planet. But then I started racing cars. I, I had a bucket list that I started in high school. And one of the things on my bucket list was to drive a race car because I was always getting in trouble for speeding. <laughs> and I just had this really curious, I, I needed to know what it felt like to drive a car and not have any limits and not have the risk of getting pulled over and getting in trouble. And I went to a racing school in 2000 and I was the only female at the racing school and I ended up being the fastest car on the track. And there was somebody at the track that day that was like a local NASCAR regional team owner. And he just came over and talked to me for a few minutes and encouraged me to pursue racing because he said, you know, you have some natural talent. There's very few women in our sport. And so that following week, I went out and I got a sports marketing company to help me. And it took me nine months to find my first sponsor to run on a little short track in San Diego. And I ran my first race in 2001 and I ended up racing for 18 years. Wow. Um, but over the course of that, that experience racing um, in 2006, a movie called an inconvenient truth came out and I was very moved by that. Not that I, I wasn't already concerned about environmental issues, but it made me feel the urgency in a new way. And so I decided to start to use my race car to address these issues and to utilize, you know, my voice as a driver to talk to the race fans. And that was a really interesting experience. I mean, I got a lot of pushback um, 
you know, I started to use my car to promote environmental issues that I cared about. And I mean, the commitment to adopt and protect an acre of rainforest every time I sat in my car. And I had this kind of light bulb moment that happened um, when I noticed that my racing website was getting a lot of traffic from a NASCAR forum. And it turned out that the person on the forum was really upset that I was promoting an inconvenient truth and you know, was calling me all kinds of names and throwing mm -hmm. me under the bus and saying I was brainwashed by Al Gore and global warming wasn't real. And um, a lot of people agreed. But then, you know, by the time I found the thread, it was very long. And there was people starting to question, you know, well, have you actually seen the movie? It's a little weird for you to be so mad at this driver if you haven't actually seen the movie she's talking about. And then the conversation shifted from me to the issue and the movie. And by the end of the thread, there were actually people posting graphs of the parts per million of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And that was a real, like, you know, the hair kind of stood up on the back of my neck. And I realized that my strange journey of getting a biology degree and being a passionate environmentalist and then racing all sort of all at once made sense to me because it allowed me to bring these issues up to this large racing community in a place and a demographic where most people are, are not talking about these things. And it allowed me to kind of be a bridge, you know, between the science and the environmentalists and the race fans. And then I sort of, from that moment forward, that was, that was my main goal. So really from 2006 until I retired last year after my last race at Daytona in 2019, um, I used my car to talk about, you know, climate change and renewable energy and solar power and electric cars. And um, I, I've ran a vegan car for the last three years, um, giving away free vegan food and talking about issues that I really care about. And, and I've really found that the race fans are a lot more receptive than, you know, the stereotype would, would allow you to think that they would be. And was it racing that, that brought you to the people who are making the film you're currently in, Racing Extinction. I just saw this film, and it, it is an amazing documentary. I, I highly recommend this film to anybody who's, who's listening. Uh, you can get it up at uh, Amazon Prime, or you can get it at uh, Apple, many other places. And it's, it's beautifully done. It's beautifully photographed, and it tells a gripping story. Can you tell us a little bit about the film and why you did it? Yeah, so I first got involved with the group that made the film as the Oceanic Preservation Society, and their first film was called The Cove, and it is the most winning documentary of all time. It won the Academy Award in 2010. It won over 100 awards globally. Um, it's a fantastic film, and I was so moved by it that yeah, I... This is about the killing, the Japanese uh, killing of the dolphins, right? The, yes, the the, slot, the largest slaughter of the dolphins yeah. in the world, which is in Taiji, Japan, and is closely tied, obviously, to the dolphin captivity industry. And So these are the same people? Same people that made The Cove, yes. And I was so moved by The Cove that I ended up becoming a volunteer for Rick O'Berry, who is the main activist that they feature in The Cove. And I started to help them raise awareness about the film. And um, we got to talking and I said, you know, the people that are buying tickets to SeaWorld and going to these dolphin parks, you know, a lot of them are race fans. And I'd love to be able to sort of talk about this film to the race fans. So I crowdfunded and I ran a Cove race car at Daytona in 2012, we gave a thousand DVDs away of the film. And it was at that race that Luis Sahoyas, the director of the film and also um, the Oceanic Preservation Society said, I've, I've actually got a job for you in the next movie. <laughs> and um, that job ended up being driving a very cool um, electric Tesla uh, getaway car that was also a highly modified car. It was sort of like a James Bond version of a Tesla. Yeah, it's fabulous. It's just fabulous. And it just brings the movie to such a dramatic uh, con conclusion. And, and really, they wanted you <laughs> to, to drive it as a getaway driver because some of the projections you're making were not quite authorized. 
Right. We did some projections in places that we were not welcome, so like oil refineries. And um, so we did this really cool camouflage to the car where it was actually the first car in the world with what they call electroluminescent paint. So with the flip yeah. of a switch, I could actually change the color of the car. So when I was projecting, I would have the paint on and it's this beautiful, bright blue glowing color and it kind of moves across the car almost like a cuttlefish like you know kind of pulsing from the front to the back of the car and uh and then when the cops would eventually get called of course um you know i could pull the the projector in turn off the paint and blend in and look just like a normal car i had a 20,000 lumen projection system that came out of the rear of the car which allowed me to project imagery you know very large imagery, 100 feet high, you know, from a thousand feet away. And um, and I also had a disappearing license plate. And this film ties together various threads. I mean, it sort of starts off by talking about species extinction, but then it, it, it brings in um, meat production, climate change, our diets, our, our habits. It, was that the idea from the from the beginning? Was to show how these threats are related? These these developments on our planet are related. Yeah. So you know, in general, the film was about the six mass extinction of species that we're living through right now, which scientists have called the Anthropocene, which translates to the age of man. It's where our human impact on the planet is so great that we're actually changing the fossil record of the future. So right now we are driving species to a rate of extinction, which is approximately a thousand times faster than the natural background rate. And all of the human activity that we participate in, whether that's you know food or transportation, the burning of fossil fuels, all of these things are contributing um, to the destruction of the natural world, the destruction of biodiversity, and, and what that means for the health of the overall system. Um, so we go into, you know, wet markets, like, like um, we're in Guangzhou, China, um, in a very similar wet market to the one in Wuhan where the coronavirus is thought to come out of. Um, so we're dealing not only with sort of our direct hand in taking endangered species off the planet by, by killing them and like the black market trade of them, which is actually a huge business, it's second only to the drug market, um, and also sort of the indirect hand of man, which is, you know, through our acidifying the oceans and, and uh, polluting our waters and, and warming the planet, climate change, habitat destruction, all of these things that are, you know, sort of not directly going out and killing that endangered animal, but through those processes, we are taking them out very quickly. This was filmed before the pandemic. But when I saw those scenes of the wet market in, in Guangzhou, just I actually hadn't seen what they were talking about before. Now I could understand it so much better to understand this relationship between climate change and habitat destruction and then pandemics. The coronavirus outbreak, you know, I think it's really bringing to the forefront of, of the conversation globally, you know, what our abuse of the natural world and our abuse of animals is is bringing as far as risk to us. So the CDC actually, they estimate that three quarters of new human diseases actually originate from animals. And so, you know, as we are throwing off the balance of the natural ecosystems, as we destroy their habitats, as we pollute their habitats, as we acidify and warm our oceans and our earth, and, and in the process we lose biodiversity and we cause species extinction, and so we're increasing the frequency where these viruses have the opportunity to make the jump either from the wild or from a wild species maybe interacting with livestock and then making the jump to humans through our livestock consumption. And because we're killing 80 billion land animals every year for meat, um, and if you were to, to take a scale and weigh all of the land mammals on the planet, 32% of the weight would come from humans. Hmm. 67% would come from livestock we're raising for meat or our domestic pets. And then just 1% is wild animals. Wow. 
So we're really, we're really stealing the natural resources away from wildlife for our needs and destroying the natural world. And then it completely throws off the balance of those ecosystems. And, you know, as long as we continue on this path that we're on, I mean, I really think we're setting ourselves up to, to take ourselves off the planet as well. And of course, all of these issues are heavily impacted by the sheer number of human beings on the planet. In the, in the, in the movie, <laughs> one of the uh, activists says that the baby boom generation is the single most impactful generation of mammals this planet has ever seen. And w- what he's talking about is what we're doing, but part of that is also just our sheer numbers. Right. So this is a big issue for me. I, I had a biochemistry professor at UC San Diego that I, when I was like 20, um, I went into biochemistry class one day and he told the class to close our books and he showed us a film about human population. And I was so blown away because I had never before that day even thought about the numbers of people on our planet. And, you know, a large part of climate change, of course, I feel like so many environmental organizations don't address this issue, but in my lifetime, the population has nearly doubled. So it took humanity 200,000 years to reach our first billion people, and we did that in the year 1804. But then it only took us 126 years to hit our second billion, then only 30 years to hit our third billion, and then just 14 years to hit our fourth billion, which happened the year I was born, which is 1974. And then, you know, now we're rapidly approaching 8 billion. So we've consistently been adding a billion people to the planet about every 12 years since I was born. And, you know, I know a lot of people like to talk about consumption and certainly consumption is a problem, but you can't address consumption without factoring in the number. So when you look at a rectangle, the area of a rectangle is determined both by its length and its width. So just the same as our impact on the planet is determined both by our level of consumption and the numbers of people that are doing the consuming. And all of these things that we've been talking about you know, climate change, ocean acidification, species extinction, loss of biodiversity, population growth compounds every single one of these problems. And I think the future of life on our planet depends upon us addressing it. What are you doing now around the film? How can people see this film? What kind of activities are you doing now to promote it? So the film, um, the film came out for the first time in 2015 on the Discovery Channel. And we had 36 million viewers on that night of our TV premiere, which is mm. really good for an environmental documentary film, um, but not so great when you consider the whole population. It's such a small percentage. Um, but you can rent the film. It's available on iTunes, Amazon, um, Google. And we've actually had a real resurgence of the film because of the coronavirus and we, um, you know, the, the wet market footage that we have. And then we have also made the film available for free for teachers worldwide um, for ages kindergarten through 12th grade. And so teachers can just go to racingextinction.com and click on education. And um, there's actually free lesson plans. So regardless of what age of students you're teaching, um, you know, it's very turnkey for you. You'll already have the lesson plan and then you just send us a request. There's a, a section on the website where you can request a screening and for teachers, we'll give you a free download of that. And we've actually been doing quite a few question and answers with um, students online. So my son teaches high school at Montgomery Blower uh, High School here in, in, uh, in, in Maryland. So if he does this, if he goes to, what is it, Racing, racingextinction.com, clicks, gets the lesson plan, does a lesson plan, makes the kids watch the movie, he could get you to talk to them? Absolutely. I would love to. Um, even Luis Ahoyas, our director, when he's available, has been also joining. We're, we're doing a, a big event on May 15th cool. because May 15th is actually Endangered Species Day. Um, so we're doing a screening online and um, Louis and myself and one of the other activists in the film, Sean Heinrichs, will be doing a live Q&A. 
Um, so we're doing quite a bit of outreach. I mean, it's, it's funny, all of the yeah, issues yeah, that yeah. we're talking about in the film are, are still happening now. If anything, they're, they're a little bit worse than they were when we were filming um, the movie. So the movie's relevance has not gone away. In fact, it's probably become even more timely with the outbreak of coronavirus. That's exactly what, what I thought when I was watching it. And, uh, and you know, you, you're never bored while you're watching this. You don't feel like you're being taught something. You're on this adventure. You're, you're on this. You're on this crusade, and it's just it, it's gripping. It just carries you a, along. And it, of course, I'm looking at this in in light of what I'm working on now, which is trying to redefine national security. Because when when you're in Washington and you talk about national security, we mean guns. We mean big budgets. We mean uh, military threats, weapons programs, great power relations. And as, as a result of the domination in our sort of thinking about the, this, we end up spending 60% of all discretionary spending goes to the Pentagon because we believe or have been told to believe that that's the best way to protect our nation. But how, are, how do you think about security? What, what matters most to you when you think about protecting our country, protecting our world? Yeah, I, I think I think it's crazy that sixty percent is going um, to the Pentagon. Our future challenges and the threats to our national security are going to come from a lot of places that have nothing to do uh, with weapons and guns. So, you know, just the coronavirus I think has killed nearly eighty thousand people now in the U.S. and it's approaching three hundred thousand globally. I think we're already at over two hundred eighty thousand. Um, and so for me, being an environmentalist, the, the biggest threats that I think about immediately are pathogens and, and climate change. Um, so I just listened to this great TED talk by a woman called Michelle Walker, and she was making the case that these high impact threats that humanity is facing, um, but that we know are coming should actually be called instead of black swans, they should be called gray rhinos because mm -hmm. we know they're coming and we can see them approaching like a charging rhino. And I feel like climate change and pathogens definitely fall into that group. They're dangerous. We know that they're coming. We know for certain that they're in our future and we can see them coming towards us. Yeah. And yeah. so obviously, like in my head, we should be transitioning more of our our budget towards fighting climate change. Um, so, so moving away from fossil fuels and towards renewable energy that's, that's from the wind, the water, or the sun. So like I'm sitting right now in, in my solar powered house that's been solar powered since January, 2014. I have two electric cars in the garage. Mm -hmm. I have not gone to a gas station since September, 2013. I've done mm -hmm. over 93,000 miles off of free uh, solar electrons that land on the roof of my house every day. Um, I think we need to invest in, in electric cars, obviously, like the manufacturing side, but also in putting in like a high speed charging infrastructure all across the U.S. I think we need to put money into developing more plant-based alternatives to meat and dairy, because as you saw in the film, a large amount of greenhouse gas emissions are are actually coming from um, the livestock, the meat and dairy industry. Well, I, I'm with you on this. I don't eat meat, haven't for many, many, 20 or more years. And I was struck by this quote. One of the uh, people in the film said, if every American skipped meat and cheese just one day a week for a year, it'd be like taking 7,600,000 cars off the road. It's an incredible impact what you put on your plate. And that's something that's easy to do. You know, an electric car is more of a commitment. Solar on your home is more a commitment. There's a lot of people that, you know, live in apartment buildings or condos. They can't choose to put up the panels. But all of us three times a day are sitting down to eat a meal. And then, of course, healthcare. You know, you can't uh, look at what's going on right now and think about the fact that, you know, we need all Americans to have health insurance. Um we need to have more funds going to the CDC and the World Health Organization and NIH and the programs. Um, there was one that I was reading about called Predict that um, they track viruses in the wild and they try and predict where our next pandemic is going to come from. And actually one of their predictions that they were concerned about and were actively researching was 
they were noticing that there was a pattern of obscure illnesses that were uh, affecting remote villagers in southern China. And they traced it and discovered that a lot of those villagers that were getting sick were villagers that were using bat guano or bat droppings um, for either medicine or fertilizers. And so they were actively like sequencing the genes of these coronaviruses that they had extracted from horseshoe bats um, so that they could begin, you know, working on vaccines for the future because they thought that something was going to come out of these bats. And the Trump administration ended the research in 2018. Um, Predict even said they received a cease and desist letter. <laughs> and then all of their funding was completely cut in 2019. And, you know, now here we are uh, with a global pandemic from a coronavirus that it looks like it either came out directly from horseshoe bats or perhaps the horseshoe bat infected a pangolin and then the pangolin uh, made the jump to humans. So I think it's just, it's pretty clear that like the military and more weapons, that's not, that's not going to protect us against future pandemics. It's not going to protect us against climate change. If we address these issues and like our country makes the move towards renewable energy, then we won't be so dependent on our military securing our energy interests overseas. And it's a win-win across the board. Yeah, I am with you. I believe the most serious threats to our security and well-being are not military. They're what we're doing to ourselves and they're interrelated as your film and our talk have sort of demonstrated. And one of the, some of those interrelations can be beneficial. Nu I work a nuclear war. Nuclear war is a low probability, high consequence event. Climate change, habitat destruction are high probability, high consequence events. As you say, they're rhinos coming, they're charging at us. We know they're coming. Well, the relationship is that you can actually reduce the risk of nuclear war by spending less money on nuclear weapons and nuclear command and control, spending, pending, spending more time on diplomacy and arms control agreements that can reduce the threat. And then you can shift those funds over to dealing with the more urgent threats, these rhinos coming, uh, charging at us. You say in the film, it can't just be the environmentalists who care about getting off fossil fuels. Everybody has to be one part of it. And and that's, I, I agree with that. And I it can't just be arms control advocates who are working on nuclear weapons. It can't just be um, peace activists who are trying to cut the military budget. It's got to be all of us. We have to build up a consensus in this country that we can shift money to from the military to these non-military threats, and we would be safer. This would be better than what we have now. Exactly. And that, that's a really good example of what I was trying to do in the racing world was reach out to, you know, people that didn't agree with me. You have to kind of get outside of your box and talk to the people that don't agree with you in order to move the needle in the right direction. And we actually did a race car with a group called Operation Free. Um, that is a group of veterans that are fighting for clean energy on Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. And so we had um, the vets out. We had, um, we had a military general out at the racetrack talking to race fans, you know, telling them, look, every time you buy gasoline at the pump, you are helping put bullets and guns that are being fired at us. You know, we can become energy independent by making the shift towards renewables. And it was such a powerful message because, you know, the NASCAR community has a long standing relationship with like, there's always been an army race car on the track. And, you know, it's, it's a big part of that community. So it was really powerful for these NASCAR fans to come to my tent at the racetrack and meet military generals and veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan saying, look, there's a reason why, you know, we are actively fighting against fossil fuels on Capitol Hill. It's because it's dangerous for us. In fact, most of the the deaths were coming from soldiers that were transporting fuel mm. because they would target the guys that were moving the fuel because of course it's explosive. And um, it was very powerful. And I, and I really, I learned so much from being in that racing world and trying to find something in common with someone 
that seemingly is on the other side of the fence for me, right? I'm very, I'm a vegan, I'm a biologist, I'm a electric car driver, solar power, hippie chick mm-hmm. girl. And here I'm in this NASCAR community that's, you know, in many ways, like feels, and they're not all, I don't want to try and paint them in a stereotype, but that there are a lot of them are meat eaters. A lot of them are, you know, more conservative and they're Republican. And so it was, it was a difficult, more difficult conversation to have. And of course um, there, there was a little more, I think, confrontation because people didn't want to hear my message, but because I was a race car driver, they'd kind of, you know, especially because I was a girl race car driver and there's so few women, um, they'd kind of overlook that because I think I was a little bit of a curiosity in the garage because I was so different from everybody else. And then when I would get them and I would get to start talking to them, I would win them over by sort of explaining why I had an electric car or why solar makes sense or, you know, what we're doing to our planet, why it's healthier for them. A lot of them, you know, a lot of America in general has heart disease and diabetes and struggles with their weight and how eating a plant-based burger instead of a meat-based burger was so much healthier for their bodies. And, you know, I had lots of race fans the last three years that I ran the vegan car, we gave away 30,000 vegan cheeseburgers in um, 2018 at five of my race weekends. And we could not make these burgers fast enough. (laughs) And it was fascinating because I was having race fans come through my tent and say, I went through your tent last year at Daytona when you were giving away the vegan chicken wings in 2017 and me and my dad have been vegan ever since and we've Mm -hmm. lost 50 pounds and he's off his heart medication. And so I was hearing all these amazing stories of race fans that even though they might've been skeptical when they came up to my vegan tent after they tasted the vegan food and were like, Oh, this is really good. This tastes just like a chicken wing or it tastes just like my normal hamburger that would sort of open the door for them to say, hmm, okay, well, maybe this makes sense. And by them doing that, they weren't just improving their health. They were also reducing their impact on, on the environment. Um, and they were, of course, saving animals. Um, so it's, it, there, there's so many good and positive things about these moves that we're making. Excellent. Well, Leilani, you have been such an inspiration. You, you, you've had such a tremendous impact on, on people. You impacted me. I think we first met when around the Cove. You were starting to work on the Cove. And uh, even then, I remember you talking about solar panels. And then when you got your Tesla, you had this line about you were just literally driving on sunshine now. And you inspired me to put solar panels in my house. And now I have a Tesla and I use that same line. I plug it in during the day. It's charging right now as we're recording this. And I haven't been to a gas station since uh, last August, since I bought the car. So thank you very much for your personal inspiration. Thank you for your, your, your friendship. This is one of my last seven podcasts that I'm doing before I leave. Uh, Plowshares Fun. And I wanted desperately to get you to have this talk, to t- talk about exactly what we just did. The, the bigger picture... Thank you so much, Joe. I I really value our friendship and I admire so much the work that you've done throughout your life. And um, I have to tell all your viewers, maybe they've already seen it. But the first time that I ever saw Joe was <laughs> when he was on a little segment from the Colbert Report that used to be on Comedy Central hosted by Stephen Colbert. And he had a segment that was called Better Know a Lobby. <laughs> and you have to this day, and I, I, I am pretty certain that I've watched every single episode of The Daily Show with Jon Stewart and The Colbert <laughs> Report. And to this day, I believe that your interview with Colbert is the funniest interview that he's done in his career. So for any of your fans that are listening, please, when you, when you hang up this podcast, go Google Joe Serencioni, the Colbert report, and you will see the funniest, <laughs> the funniest yeah, I, interview I, of all time. Well, thank you very much. It's true. If you Google nuclear Colbert, you get me and we're talking. Well, thank you, Leilani. Thank you for thank you for everything. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for everything you, you're you're doing. Uh, it's been a real pleasure talking with you today. Thank you, Joe. 
Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced by Delphine Vigil, Zach Brown, Derek Zender, Alex Spire, and Will Lowry. Sound design by Derek Zender. Audio engineering by Derek Zender and Will Lowry. Research by Alex Spire. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.